the Herald in Wall Township, um, first as a reporter and then as the editor of that. And then I moved over to um, the Freehold Journal, which was owned by the Esbury Park Press and worked there as a reporter. Uh, and I was transferred by them down to um, Brick and I worked for the Ocean County Journals or two down there for a while. And then I came back as the editor of the Freehold um, Journal. And because I had an interest in history, I was history major at Washington and Lee University in Virginia. Um, I always incorporated the writing of some history in whatever I did journalistically uh, for all the newspapers I worked for. And um, you know, once I left the, uh, the journal and Freehold, I still wrote a few things uh, on history for the Asbury Park Press afterwards. Um, subsequently, I became the editor of uh, Monmouth College, now Monmouth University Magazine. And I also wrote historical pieces for that magazine and continued to do th so throughout my career. Uh, I later became a history professor at Monmouth University for a while, and I've since moved on to Rutgers, where I'm a research uh, associate research professor in the technical language um, at the Thomas Edison Papers, um, where we look through tens of thousands of documents pertaining to uh, Thomas Edison over a four-year period and then decide which 300 or 350 most express uh, what he was interested in during a three-year period publish those uh, with annotations that explain what the documents are, who he's talking about, what the technologies are, that sort of thing. So uh, it's sort of like being a modern monk. Uh, in that I live in, I work in a little office up there uh, looking at these documents, mainly online, sometimes uh, from the archives, and uh, try to interpret these documents for the technical uh, community, also for uh, historians and other scholars, and uh, and for the general public to some degree as well. So that's a little encapsulation of my career. Because I had written short histories uh, from 1987, I'm still doing it, um, so it goes a little beyond this book. Um, when I looked back uh, at the things I had written, I said, you know what, maybe I'll put these together. They might be of interest or of use to people. And so I revised them, and uh, that's how Nearer Home uh, came about. Maybe I should say, because we're in Middletown, that I initially looked through all the old newspapers that I'd worked on because I had uh, written a column that appeared in the Freehold Journal. It was also published in the Advisor Journal here in Middletown uh, called Early Monmouth, which dealt with 17th century Monmouth County and uh, just the very beginning of 18th century Monmouth County. And uh, so I went back into the newspapers to look for those columns to publish those. I thought that would make a nice little book. And then I discovered all these other little histories. And I, I said, well, maybe I'll you do something with those. About so me. the early Monmouth book, I'm still working on, maybe two years from now will come out. And that will pertain uh, more to Middletown than near home to uh, Will. Yeah, um, yeah. In the interim, um, next month, I have a book of poems coming out. It's a kind of an epic poem about five World War I poets from Britain who all died in World War I, uh, along with some hymns to them. Um, that should be out next month. It's called um, We No More Sang for the Bird. And, uh, and then next year, I think, I'll have a, a book dealing with the literary history of Monmouth County uh, in, the, in the early part from... Uh, say this in the 1680s uh, up through um, the early Republic period of, uh, of US history. Um, so that's something to look for if you're interested in those kinds of things. Um, I think what I'll do is uh, I have some pictures. So maybe I'll, uh, I, I, ha I wanted to read a few passages from the book. So maybe I'll start with uh, one of the pictures and we'll talk about uh, why William L. Dayton's picture is up here. And, and then I'll read a passage from one of the uh, the pieces and, and discuss that that way. Um, maybe before I get into that, I should say the two places where I was invited to speak about this book, uh, Long Branch and here in Middletown, 
Um, there really isn't a lot in this book on either one of those places, simply because of the way the book came to be. I worked mainly in Western Monmouth County, so there's a lot more on Freehold and Emily's Town and, uh, and that area of the county, uh, rather than in the Eastern End. But the very first um, chapter of the book does deal with a, a story from Middletown. Uh, it's about uh, throwing the stocking uh, Baptist style. I don't know if anybody knows what that means. Um, this was an old uh, custom uh, that the Baptists in Middletown and uh, I suppose elsewhere in New Jersey uh, used to engage in uh, after uh, a wedding ceremony had taken place. And um, you can, uh, vestiges of this remain in weddings today where uh, the, you know, the uh, when the unmarried women at a a wedding will throw the bouquet, or the, or the bride will throw the bouquet, and the unmarried women will try to catch it. In uh, throwing the stocking, um, this came from England, and in England it was uh, a little more organized. So, uh, what would happen is um, after the bride and groom had been married, and there was a little party uh, at their house, uh, the bride would go up to her bedroom. Uh, where the marriage was going to be consummated and the bridesmaids would come up and they'd have balled up stockings in their hands and they'd stand at the end of the bed and they'd throw them uh, over their shoulders at the bride and whoever hit the bride first uh, was deemed to be the next one to be married. Um, here in Middletown uh, in the early part of the 18th century uh, it seems that this became a little more of a, a raucous game. Uh, once the bride and the groom had both gone into their bedroom, uh, the wedding guests would break into the bedroom. Uh, in, the, in the one case here, uh, which is uh, detailed in Jonathan Holmes' little diary, he wrote, kept a little diary. He was a Middletown uh, person who was a member of the Baptist church here. And he said they, the bride and groom locked the door and they wouldn't let anybody in. So somebody climbed in through the window <laughs> and opened the door and let everybody in. And um, for, uh, in, in the United States, or at least in New Jersey, what would happen is uh, since the bride had already gone to bed, she'd already taken off her stockings. Uh, so there would be a scramble to find where she'd put the stockings, they would find them. And then they would play keep away from her and throw them around the room. And Jonathan Holmes said, I found one, you know, one of the stockings in one hand and another one under the bed, and I threw it and it hit the bride in the nose and everybody cracked up and, and uh, we decided to call it a day and we all went home. So I thought that was a fascinating little story in this guy's diary and I wrote about it for the Asbury Park Press. But that's really the only Middletown connected story uh, in near home. Um, in terms of uh, William L. Dayton, the reason I chose this picture is not because he figures so largely in near home, but just because it's an awesome picture. It's probably the best photo in the book. Uh, you know, I love all the uh, little striations on the picture, probably coming from the glass plate. Has anybody heard of William L. Dayton before? Um, he's not uh, someone who was born in Monmouth County. He was born in Northern Jersey. Uh, and that's where he grew up and had his schooling. And um, and then he became a lawyer and came to Freehold to practice law. Um, one of the things, this is not in the book, but this will be uh, discussed. Oh, sorry. This will be discussed in, um, uh, in the literary histories that are coming up, is that uh, when Philip Freneau uh, spent his last night in Freehold, uh, there are divergent stories about what he was doing there. People said he was getting drunk. Um, and uh, I kind of doubt that. He had a little bit of a reputation for um, drinking. And uh, I really think that he, he was not an alcoholic or a drunk. He was a poet uh, and a writer. So people in Western Monmouth didn't really see him working a lot. And uh, he was French by extraction. After all, so he did sometimes drink wine, and that was enough for uh, you know rather straight-laced people to accuse him of things. He was, of course, 80 years old on the night he died, and this was the night that he was in Freehold. And by one account, he spent some time at uh, 
a library in Freehold. Uh, this was in the uh, 1830s. And he was discussing things with William L. Dayton, uh, who was a lawyer in Freehold then. And then he moved on to the general store where he probably had another drink or so and, uh, and then tried to go home. And a big snowstorm hit. It was a blizzard. Might have lost his way. He was trying to climb over a fence. And his hip might have broken. And he fell in the snow. And he wasn't found until the next day. So Philip Freneau, uh, you know, probably uh, the greatest poet uh, of the 18th century in the uh, in America and later in the United States uh, passed on that way. But he may have spent his last evening with William L. Dayton. Uh, Dayton went on to become a U.S. Senator from New Jersey for a while, uh, not uh, too long. And, um, and then he becomes really nationally known uh, because he ran for vice president on the first Republican ticket with John C. Freeman in 1856. A lot of people don't realize that uh, there was a Republican candidate for president prior to Lincoln, uh, but of course he wasn't elected. And uh, that was the end of uh, Dayton's um, political career, I would say, uh, after he ran for vice president. When Lincoln became president, he appointed him to be the ambassador to France. And uh, Dayton is credited uh, with preventing the French from building warships for the Confederacy. So he played a role in uh, helping the federal government win the Civil War in that way. And he died while he was in Paris. Uh, some people uh, say he died under scandalous conditions or some evidence that he was uh, visiting a mistress there when he had a heart attack and died. Um, but the book is still sort of out on that because it was kind of hushed up, of course, and it's kind of difficult uh, uh, more than 100 years later to assess what the evidence is really telling us. But there were some rumors about that. So um, that's Dayton's background. He appears in Nearer Home. Uh, because he was uh, the lead attorney, he was the state attorney. and told people that uh, Moses had died, but he hadn't, he was still alive in his room. He only had a short time to live with his throat cut, but he was still alive. And when people went in his room, he told them that Donnelly had murdered him. Uh, and it turned out that they were, had been playing cards, the two men, uh, the night before. And, um, Donnelly said they, that he had left the, uh, Moses' room uh, earlier in the evening. They had been playing cards, but there was no ill will between them. Um, and uh, Moses just uh, denied that. And he was he still stayed alive uh, by the time the Justice of the Peace came to do an inquest. Um, it was found that uh, $100 in gold was missing from the safe. Um, some uh, $55 uh, in gold was uh, 
under Moses' mattress, uh, who he apparently won it from Donnelly. Uh, the other $45 Donnelly still had. Um, Donnelly was seen in the yard hiding something in the grass. It was probably a dirk knife, uh, they think it was. Uh, and there were other reasons to believe that he probably did commit the crime. So he was taken off to Freehold and put in jail there. There was some threat uh, that Irish rebels off the coast were going to land and try to free him. He did escape from his cell once and uh, made it into the jail yard before he was apprehended. And, um, and then finally, uh, the militia were called in, uh, three companies of militia to, uh, to uh, guard the jail uh, on the day that he was executed there after being convicted. Um, this is a very high profile trial. The New York papers covered it. Uh, it was covered even in London to some degree. And, uh, and so William L. Dayton, who was the uh, attorney general of the state, uh, was the person who handled the, uh, the prosecution for the state. Joel Parker, uh, who became governor during the Civil War in 1863, I think is when he became governor, uh, handled the prosecution for the county. And his house is still there in Freehold. If you go down Main Street, you see Parker House. That's where he lived. Um, and for the prosecution, a former governor, William Pennington, uh, appeared for Donnelly. And um, and so did uh, Joseph Bradley, who becomes a U.S. Supreme Court justice later on. So it was a very high profile uh, case. Uh, and a lot of prominent lawyers wanted to be involved in it, uh, probably because it put them before the public in such a striking way. Uh, Donnelly continued to protest his innocence, and uh, he was hung out in freehold. He blamed William Smith. He said he was the one that committed the murder. So, so that's the reason uh, William L. Dayton appears in, in the book. And, um, you know, some of uh, some more of his life and times will be in my upcoming book uh, on, uh, on the literary history when I get to Philip Frenneau. Um One of the things I covered uh, in the 80s when I worked for uh, the Brick and Tom's River journals were histories of iron forges in Ocean County. And uh, there was a lot of bog iron in uh, Southern Monmouth and in Ocean County. And so one of the earliest industries uh, in this area was uh, iron forging. Um, there were uh, there were some iron mines in New Jersey, but in this area, there were it was really uh, uh, stuff that was taken out of lakes and creeks and stuff anywhere they could see, like uh, rust-colored rocks was a sign that iron was present. Uh, so I went and I uh, visited the areas where these forges were, um, and of course, there's no trace of of any of them really in Ocean County anymore. Um, in Monmouth County, in Tinton Falls, there was the first iron forge uh, in New Jersey, which is sometimes said to be the first industry ever in New Jersey. But uh, I know that uh, during the Dutch period, there was a brewery up in North Jersey. So I guess brewing is an industry. So maybe that would uh, predate uh, Lewis Morris's iron forge in uh, what is Tinton Falls. So right where that little falls is there on... Uh, uh, 537, where the little cluster of restaurants is, is where that iron forge was. Okay. Um, this is from the chapter uh, Farago and Dover Forges. And I'll read a little bit of this. On the road by auto from Tom's River to Bamber Lake in Lacey Township, New Jersey, it is still easy to imagine the landscape as it must have looked in the early 19th century Except for the nearly deserted Macadam Highway, Route 618, there is little but white sand and the gnarled forms of scrub pines thrusting green tufted fists to the sky. On just about any brisk winter morning, a palpable stillness still settles about the lake. The small beach just beyond the chain link fence invites no bathers, and a small rambunctious creek running off through thicket intervening woods, mutes the sound of traffic from Lacey Road, 
magnifying the subtle creak of a lifeless oak against a penetrating quiet. Across the chill water, the pines cut like dark saw teeth into a bland sky. No one is about. Amid the quiet, a colorless sign bolted to the roadside fence inordinately warns, this beach and lake for residents and taxpayers of Lacey Township only, and concludes with a vague threat, violators will be fined. But only the sign is loud. The rest, even the deserted ball field across the way is still. And it is this winter stillness and perhaps the conical pines across Bamber Lake that are the last vestiges of an earlier time when the first men came here to stay. Maybe it was General John Lacey himself whose eye first passed over the landscape at the tail end of the 18th century, judging it suitable for a forge. The Pinelands were even quieter then Travelers along the sand roads cutting east to Barnegat Bay or west to Philadelphia were lulled by the tranquility of the needle carpeted fire forests. But the coming of the forges changed all that. Um, if you go north of uh, Boston, uh, there's a little town, Saugus. I don't know if anybody's been there. And there's a working 17th century iron forge there. So after I wrote these, uh, and because I wrote later about uh, the Tinton uh, Falls Forge, I had to make a trip up there to see what this was really like. Um, and the interesting thing is that uh, the two of the um, people who were connected with building and operating Saugus Iron Forge in Massachusetts in the 17th century were brought down here from, by Lewis Morris, who lived at Tinton Manor, which Tinton Falls is now named after, and owned the Iron Forge. And they helped him set up the Iron Forge there. So uh, whatever the forge was here, very similar, I assume, to what uh, is in Saugus today. <laughs> and um, these forges are remarkable. They had uh, bellows to keep the fire hot. And uh, the ones at Saugus, there are three leather bellows, and they're taller than I am. They're like seven feet tall. Uh, and they're operated by a water wheel. And as the wa water wheel turns, uh, it uh, presses uh, on this kind of arm that presses all the forges together and blows the air into the fire, you know, uh, to keep uh, the fire hot enough to melt iron. The other really interesting uh, aspect of these forges is they had um, hammers that weighed 200 or more pounds. And this was to beat the impurities out of the iron. Uh, the impurities would uh, cause the iron to be brittle and to break easily. Uh, so the iron had to be beaten uh, by these 200 pound hammers. In those days, um, when these hammers struck, they could be heard for miles and you know 25 miles away, uh, they could be heard and closer by the whole earth would <laughs> reverberate. But that just tells you how quiet things were in Monmouth County in those days. I can't imagine if, if that were happening uh, in the next neighborhood over nowadays, I would be able to hear it, you know? Although sometimes you can hear the train uh, at my house in Eatontown all the way from Little Silver, the wind's right. So maybe, you know, uh, maybe it would be possible. On to the next picture. Oh, going the wrong direction, let's see. Uh, this is the uh, the jockey Joseph Laird, and uh, he's a stride um, fashion, uh, which was one of the uh, most famous racehorses of uh, the earlier part of the 19th century. Joseph Laird is part of the Laird family uh, of Laird's Applejack fame. His father was the owner of the Colts Neck Inn, which he took over in 1817. Uh, and his father was the Applejack maker. Um, and the Laird family is still making Applejack, although I don't think they make it in Monmouth County anymore. Uh, when I wrote about the Laird's family, this was in the 80s, they were making the Applejack in Virginia. And uh, they explained to me that they, there are a lot of apples out in Colts Neck still, there are orchards and stuff. Uh, but they said uh, the 
Department of Environmental Protection had complained about their operations because the creek behind the distillery smelled like apples, uh, and that was a form of pollution. <laughs> So in Virginia, I guess they don't give a damn, or at least they didn't then, whether your creek smelled like apples or not. And that's where they started making their Applejack. Uh, after you know having made it here in Monmouth County since the 1680s, um, it got shifted. Of course, their headquarters is still here in Monmouth County, and they're still connected to the county. Um, what might not be as well known is uh, that the Lairds were very uh, involved in horse racing in the 19th century. Samuel Laird, in addition to being a, an innkeeper and a maker of booze, uh, was also a horse trainer. And uh, during his time, he was probably the most famous and accomplished horse trainer in the United States. Um, and he trained this horse fashion and his son became the jockey. And here he is, uh, it's not in color, but it was said that uh, Joseph Laird wore a distinctive costume he had a purple silk tunic, I guess that's his tunic. You can see whether it's silk or purple. And he had a, uh, a velvet uh, little helmet, a green velvet helmet. So everyone would know uh, that was Joseph Laird. And he was the most accomplished jockey of the, uh, of the time, uh, only to be superseded after he retired from uh, racing. Um, why is fashion important? Well, uh, starting in 1820, and uh, if you remember your uh, American history, 1820 was an important year. Uh, anybody know the reason? The, the main reason 1820 is important? Uh, that's the year the Missouri, um, the, a compromise was uh, signed, uh, which narrowly averted a civil war in the United States over the issue of slavery and states' rights. And this precipitated a sectional rivalry between the North and the South. And one of the ways this manifested itself starting in uh, 1820 uh, was uh, through a series of uh, races pitting the great champion horse of the North against the great champion horse of the South. Unfortunately for the South, uh, uh, the North had a horse named American Eclipse, which was never defeated. <laughs> so until American Eclipse became too old to run, the South was always uh, on the losing end of these uh, these events. Um, but uh, after American Eclipse, the South did manage to win a few of these. Uh, and they... Uh, by the 18, late 1830s, they had the greatest racehorse in the country. This was uh, Boston, oddly named after a city in the north. Uh, it was a horse from Virginia. Um, fashion uh, raced against Boston in a preliminary race and, and beat Boston. But um, the Southerners said it wasn't a fair race. It really didn't show or pit the best horse from the south against the north because at the time, Boston was not uh, in tip-top racing form. So they wanted a rematch. The rematch occurred in 1842 at the Union Race Course uh, on Long Island. Um, and 60 to 70,000 people turned out for this race, uh, including congressmen and uh, Army and Navy officers and uh, all the great uh, elite uh, families from Manhattan, um, wagers uh, overall went above $200,000 at a time when a dollar was really worth a lot of money. Uh, the owners of the two horses wagered $20,000 uh, each. Uh, the owner of the, uh, Boston said that his horse would win, uh, even predicted the time in which it would win. It was a record-breaking time. Um, but fashion actually won the race. Uh, and I should explain how these races happened in the 19th century, quite different than would happen now at Monmouth Park. Uh, the horses ran at least uh, two races of four miles uh, each, right? Uh, and there would be more than just a, two uh, headline horses. Other horses would be involved as well as they are now. Um, 
after two uh, races, if there was, if no horse had won both races, uh, there would be a third heat uh, in which all the horses could again participate. Um, if none of uh, if none of the horses had won two races by then, now, now they've run like uh, 16 miles, right? There would be a fourth race of four miles of just the two top contenders and they would run a uh, four mile track. So it wasn't actually on a racetrack, it was on a course, it would go through kind of the course. And um, Fashion won the first uh, two races, so uh, wiped out the field uh, and uh, had a world record breaking time. Uh, so this is why fashion became uh, so important. Um, later on, uh, uh, fashion ran against this, another Southern champion, Paytona, and, and lost to Paytona in a, uh, another one of these spectacular, important, famous races. But uh, fashion, you know, won the laurels at the Union course. Um, in 1842 by, by besting uh, Boston. When Paytona won, uh, uh, all of the Southern newspapers just started crowing about how, you know, a Southern horse born and bred and all this stuff had defeated the Northern champion. Uh, Joseph Laird, uh, after his racing career was over, just a few years after he uh, raced Boston, um, became a businessman in Freehold. He was a founder of the First National Bank there, later became its president. He was uh, uh, important in establishing the Freehold Fire Department and helped to build the uh, firehouse there when they got their first uh, engine and uh, was invo involved in other business enterprises in, uh, in uh, Freehold. Um, when he died, uh, there was commentary in the Freehold papers about what an upstanding businessman he was, what an honest guy he was, what a beautiful friend he was. If you made his friendship, uh, it was a lifelong friendship. There was no mention of him being a champion uh, jockey or being involved in any way in, in horse racing, oddly enough. I'm gonna read another little passage. Um, this is the most personal uh, piece in the book. It's called uh, Memento Mori, A Piece of the Moro Castle. And it was published in the literary magazine, This Broken Shore. And I, bought, I brought along with me the piece of the Moro Castle that it's about. I'm the Moro Castle it was a cruise liner. It burned uh, off the coast here in uh, 1834 under suspicious circumstances uh, due to the radio operator started the fire. Um, and uh, a lot of people died on the ship. It came to rest just off Convention Hall in the Esther Park. There's a lot of ground there. Uh, and there was a white hot smoke in the hole for the time it got there. Um, some people got off in lifeboats. The sea was rather rough that day. Uh, other people just dove into the surf and uh, swam ashore, boat in shore, and they could be naked and many bodies came ashore in Monmouth County. Um, this piece of the uh, Moral Castle was picked up on the beach of Ocean Grove right after the tragedy. And uh, you'll see it's pretty smooth. And, you know, it's almost the story uh, talks about how my family came to have this two piece of moral castle. Uh, and it's interesting when families pass down stories, oftentimes they're just incorrect or, you know, uh, people don't remember what they're told exactly and they add things in. And so this uh, story is about what I learned as a kid from my dad and how that really wasn't the case when I looked into it uh, quite. But uh, 
the one fact that was, uh, uh, you know, presented to me that you couldn't get around was this is a piece of Memorial Castle that sat in the basement of our house in Wall Township for 50 years until uh, my mother passed on and I went and got it. Um, and so some of this, my mother told me a little bit more about the story. And then some of it I had to figure out on my own, like William Faulkner in, uh, in one of uh, his books, Absalom, Absalom, where people have little pieces of the story their family told them, and they have to talk about it until they kind of come up with a plausible story. So I'll read the little first part of this. For as long as I can remember, what looked like a piece of old driftwood leaned in the corner of the basement of my parents' house in Glendola Hills, New Jersey. There it kept quietly out of the way behind the old paint blotched and little used workbenches. I must have asked my father one day what it was, and he told me it was a piece of the Morrow Castle, a ship that had burned at sea off the Jersey coast and then drifted in until it came to rest just off Convention Hall in Asbury Park. From that point on, it seemed a macabre reminder of disaster, one that had somehow been snatched out of the tide of oblivion and stowed away in some recess of our consciousness. When dad pulled the four foot piece of wood out from behind one of the workbenches and handed it to me, I noticed that it was smooth on one side, the convex side, and charred on the inside, the concave side. He told me it was a piece of the ship's railing and that the heat from the red hot steel rail to which it had been affixed had turned the inside wood to charcoal. The outside though, still wore most of its brown wood stain. It seemed to me cherry or dark mahogany, like an old well-used piece of furniture. And though it looked as if it should be heavy, it was surprisingly light in my hands. One could easily imagine it floating in toward the coast in that turgid September sea moving little by little with the Atlantic's undulations until nearer shore, it followed in the afterwake of successive breakers, only to be pushed off again in the outgoing tide, back and forth repeatedly, inching toward the beach until finally the tide's rush brought it up on the sand like a splinter out of the sea's skin. So my father told me that his father, uh, who had been a pharmacist in Asbury Park at the time, had gone down to the beach in Asbury Park uh, to help bring bodies in uh, on the beach uh, because they were going to be sent to the morgue uh, from there. Uh, I don't think that happened. Uh, my grandfather, um, James Weeks, uh, was originally from Spring Lake. Uh, he lived in Ocean Grove at this time after he got married. Um, and he probably went down to Spring Lake, uh, which was his uh, hometown, and may have helped uh, bring bodies in there. I think only one body came on shore in Asbury Park, but many came on shore in the area of Seagirt and Spring Lake. Uh, so uh, that is a possibility. In fact, I learned from my mother that uh, my grandfather didn't pick up this piece of the Morrow Castle at all uh, that was found on the beach uh, by my uh, father's great uncle, Bill Young, uh, who lived in, in Ocean Grove. So that kind of made sense to me. It came to our house in Wall Township uh, because uh, Bill Young's stepmother, uh, who uh, was my uh, father's step-grandmother, uh, came to live at my mom and dad's house in Wall Township um, just before I was born. And all her effects were brought along uh, with her, uh, William Young, Bill Young had died already. And so that's how the Morrow Castle got to Wall Township and was stuck behind the workbench uh, for 50 years um, until I dragged it out and uh, brought it over to Eatontown. And this is the first time it's appeared in public. So it's, uh, it's a little shy, but you can go pick it up and see uh, what it's all about. Um, I think I might have a picture of the Morrow Castle this way. Oh, this is, and that's what it looked like once it got off to uh, uh, off of uh, Convention Hall. And because Asbury Park was interested in making money off of attractions, uh, while it was there, they, uh, you know, charged started charging people money to 
come and see it. The problem was after a while, the, the ship started to stink so badly, they uh, had to move it out or get rid of it so that uh, it wouldn't prevent other people from coming to Asbury Park to enjoy the beach and other amusements that were there. So that's the uh, the Morro Castle. The rest of the story kind of tell, I kind of uh, blended in uh, the tragedy of the Morro Castle with the tragedy of uh, my dad's family. His uh, own mother died when he was three and his father uh, died of heart failure uh, when he was in the Navy, when he was just 18 years old. And so this kind of piece of the Morro Castle kind of witnessed how uh, basically all of the people uh, from that little household passed on, uh, uh, even as the piece of the Morro Castle stayed there, except for my father uh, and uh, his elderly um, step-grandmother who progressively went blind uh, during those years. So maybe we'll look at another picture before this. This is a, a picture taken a few years ago by my daughter, who's uh, into the dramatic, as you can see. Um, and this is Monmouth Battlefield. It's taken from the perspective of uh, where the British troops ended up at the end of the battle, uh, when they were confronted finally by uh, George Washington and the main body of the, uh, of the army. Uh, Washington would have been off in that direction uh, what you're seeing here from their perspective is Culp's Hill. And if you if you go to Monmouth Battlefield now, the little, uh, uh, what do they call it, visitor center is up there in the back. You can't see it from here. So kind of looks more like maybe it would have in those days. Uh, these were farms around here. So quite similar, I suppose. Uh, Culp's Hill uh, was where General Nathaniel, Nathaniel Green had been posted. Uh, he was uh, commanding the right wing of Washington's army. Washington uh, sent him there after uh, an officer who lived locally uh, informed Washington that that would be a great place to put artillery. <laughs> and and once uh, Green put his artillery up there, the British couldn't advance any further or do anything. And you can see why. I mean, there uh, would be directly in the line of that artillery. There would be no way for the British to attack the artillery there because there was a swamp um, between this field and, uh, and the hill. And that swamp was a lot deeper than it is now. You could just walk across it and maybe your, the bottom of your sneakers would get wet. There is a little bridge, so that doesn't happen. Um, but uh, that was the key element in uh, stopping the British from uh, moving further toward uh, what would be Tenet Church, where uh, the Americans kind of were posted. Um, I don't think I'll get into a discussion here on the Battle of Monmouth. It's one of the most confusing battles in the history of warfare. And um, fortunately, a new book is uh, has been published in the last few years. that gives a much better explanation of you know, what kind of happened. Um, this was in 1778. It was after the Declaration of Independence had been um, signed. It was also after uh, Louis XVI of France decided that the French would come in and aid uh, the new United States. That happened after the Battle of Saratoga in October 1777, when it looked like the U.S. might have a chance of winning the war. Uh, but everything kind of went downhill after that. And the British took Philadelphia, which was the capital of the new United States. Washington was uh, trying to keep his army together and train it better at Valley Forge in Pennsylvania uh, during the winter of 1777, 78. But because the, the French were coming in and they had a fleet uh, that was fairly powerful and could probably challenge the British locally, uh, the, the British government and Henry Clinton, who was the general in command, at, he was stationed in New York, uh, decided that uh, the British forces from Philadelphia would have to come back to New York and consolidate there where the British fleet could protect them better rather than have a divided British army that uh, could be prey to the French. So he marched his uh, whole army. I think he had some 8,000 troops. And most of it went uh, across the state of New Jersey, which had even worse roads then than we do now. Uh, their baggage train stretched out 12 miles on the road uh, coming through 
southern Jersey. Uh, and Washington thought with his newly trained army, with the French coming in, the American public expected that uh, the American army would make some effort to attack the British as they made this uh, trek. They were going to go up to Shrewsbury and uh, take transports there up to New York, the British were. Uh, they got to Freehold. Um, they were camping here briefly before pushing on to Shrewsbury. And... Um, and Washington did manage to attack them here. Um, and uh, you may know some of the history of that. The first attack, uh, commanded by General Charles Lee, did not go well, largely because of miscommunication, because of some insubordination on the part of uh, Lee's subsidy, uh, subordinate officers, uh, and because he didn't expect Clinton to turn his entire army back. It was already on the road going out of Freehold to fight him. <laughs> so. It was a, a much more difficult task than Lee figured. Washington didn't want to get into a general battle and have the entire army defeated or routed just when the French were coming in. He just wanted to make a little point and, uh, you know, kind of a show that he could do something against the British and then pull back. Um, so what happened is once the whole British army comes back and because of poor communication on the part of Lee and his officers, uh, they started, uh, the Americans started to retreat prematurely. He had to go over a series of morasses. Uh, Lee thought maybe he could get to Culp's Hill, but when he found that there was a big swamp in front of it, he was like that, cut off from that. So they started to move back toward where Tenet Church is, which is higher ground. And then Washington shows up with the whole army coming in from Manalapan. He's like, why are you running away? You know, and um, is able to or reorganize the army um, on the battlefield there, uh, uh, that you can visit now, just to the side of where uh, this Combs Hill, I'm sorry, I said Culp's Hill, Combs Hill is, um, and uh, stops the British there, largely because the artillery, they couldn't pass by this artillery position. And uh, of course, the British, they were interested in getting away anyway. So the next morning, uh, they packed up and headed up to Middletown and Shrewsbury, and that allowed Washington to declare a victory. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a public relations coup. It wasn't really a, a military victory, but the Americans did stand up to the British toe-to-toe, uh, -to -toe, which they hadn't really done before. So it was good publicity. It gave the troops some confidence. And, um, you know, some historians would say it, it kind of changed the character of the war after that. Probably the most important thing uh, that came out of it is uh, Congress, which was thinking about replacing Washington, uh, decided that uh, he was the right man for the job. Uh, Lee was court-martialed uh, and found guilty. It was probably um, unfair to him, uh, but it was a way of uh, getting someone who questioned Washington's judgment out of the army uh, and muting any kind of criticism of Washington. So that's what uh, the field looked like a couple of years ago. It's nice to walk around. Anybody been out there and walk around? It's a... Okay. Well, yeah, I've, I've never been to see the reenactment. But... Oh, that's good. Yeah. Uh, that didn't happen here. Um, the uh, near home is dedicated to Lieutenant Nathan Weeks. Uh, he was a, an officer in, um, I think, the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment, and he was killed at the Battle of Monmouth. He was my direct ancestor's brother. And so my direct ancestor also was in the Revolutionary War, um, uh, took in his son, uh, who was orphaned. His mother had already passed away uh, after uh, Nathan was killed at the Battle of Mama. So it had, has like a little uh, personal connection for me too there. I guess uh, we'll read. Do I have a little more time or do you want to open it up here? Okay. The uh, near home has um, is mainly popular histories, but there are two scholarly pieces in here. Uh, one is uh, Asbury Park in July 1970, civil unrest and its representation about uh, what are sometimes called the riots, the Asbury Park riots, uh, sometimes. Uh, called the Asbury Park Uprising, depending on your point of view. People I talked to that uh, were there uh, tended to call it the Troubles. I guess they didn't want to 
you know, make too much of it. I called uh, the article, uh, Ezra Park in July 1970, Civil Unrest and its representation because uh, almost all the documents I used were from the Esri Park Press or other newspapers. Uh, so I was constrained to use uh, sources that were, uh, you know, written from the perspective of newspaper reporters from various papers that were covering the event. The reason is uh, the Esri Park police records were lost in a flood. This is what I'm told. Uh, whether that is true or not, who can say? Uh, I don't know. Interestingly enough, when I wrote this piece, probably 10 years ago at, at most, uh, the state police records about the event are still sealed by the public prosecutors. So they're not allowed to be viewed uh, by any historians, uh, uh, even though this happened 50 years ago, right? So I'll, I'll read this uh, last little part. In a last attempt to hold their ground, the youths on the street hurled bottles, bricks, and firebombs at the advancing line of police. In response, gunfire rang out along the avenue, and 22-year-old Harold Suggs turned into an alley to avoid it. In the ensuing confusion, he saw his friend Herbert Gaines, just 17, suddenly clutch his leg. The blood came then in a torrent as Gaines stumbled into the alley and collapsed on the sidewalk. This was on the last day of the troubles in Asbury Park. That same day, the widow Margaret Hayes watched the thick smoke that had been billowing for two days from the buildings across the street and listened to the shouting and gunfire. She began to wonder if she would make it through alive. The heavy footsteps of angry young men hammering up and down the staircase outside her apartment frightened her. I'm a nervous wreck, she said. I have only one life and I'm trying to save it. Thanks be, I don't have any children to be in this mess. Unlike the widow Hayes, Mrs. Henry Hayes did have a teenage son who returned home that night with wounds from shotgun pellets in his arm and leg. Though shocked, she was not in sympathy with his cause. Our boy is very hostile, she said. He has lots of hostility to white people. I'm telling you this because I'm so ashamed because I can't see any cause for this. I'm ashamed to see the brutality of my own people. Others though blame the police. This I know is supposed to be their job, said one neighborhood resident, but they come in mad. I heard they even shot a little kid out in his yard. This is the way the white man acts down south. So that's the beginning of the scholarly piece on uh, on Asbury Park, uh, I should say that uh, no little kid was shot by the police. That was a rumor that went around. Um, but there was, uh, you know, uh, from you know what the reports were in the news, uh, what seems to be some excessive use of force occasionally on the part of the police, uh, which did result in uh, quite a few people being uh, wounded in Asbury Park in the summer of 1970, just after the 4th of July. The other uh, part of the book deals with Thomas Edison uh, because I work at the Edison Papers. Uh, these are things that I wrote for like the Johns Hopkins uh, University blog or other publications. And they some of them deal with controversies involving Edison these days. Uh, his purported electrocution of the elephant Topsy, which he didn't really have anything to do with, is in every newspaper, uh, simply because his film crew filmed it and uh, uh, it had his name on the film, but uh, we can't find any evidence that Edison even really knew it was happening. Uh, this was in uh, 1902. Um, and also his relations with uh, Nikolai Tesla, which is of course uh, everywhere, uh, which is also largely mythical that uh, they hated each other. In fact, Edison uh, thought uh, quite highly of uh, Nikolai Tesla as a scientist and engineer. And Tesla was extremely happy when he received the Edison mess medal later in his life uh, and was particularly honored when Edison himself showed up at the dinner. So they didn't have any uh, uncordial relationship. It's also the story that Tesla was 
angry because Edison refused to pay him $50,000 he had promised him for fixing an Edison AC system when he worked for Edison. Uh, Edison would have never promised uh, any junior engineer such a sum uh, in 1884, it was a ridiculous amount of money to promise somebody who worked for you anyway. It was just doing his job. Uh, Edis, uh, Tesla complained about the manager of the machine works, the Edison machine works, promising him this money and then reneging on paying him that after he fixed some problems with the system. But Thomas Edison was not the manager of the Edison machine works. Uh, and uh, Tesla said, um, the, the manager said, well, we only promised you that money as a joke. You don't understand our American ways. It's a little bit doubtful that uh, either of the managers of the machine works uh, at that time would have said something like that because the one was English and the other one was Polish. So neither one of them was American. Uh, although maybe they joked, maybe uh, Tesla thought they were American. I don't know. Uh, that's the story there. But now that's all uh, I have for you uh, this evening, um, and I'll take it. Uh, take some questions if you or comments or observations. I was that you mentioned the free will journal. Yeah, I, I mean I grew up with free will. I have not really recollection of that. Is that part of the threat? Uh, is it a state yes. Yes, this is uh, this is some recent Monmouth County history. Uh, the Asbury Park Press, uh, back when it was actually doing very well, and <laughs> yeah, right after they built uh, that big building in Neptune that they just recently tore down, um, they decided that they could uh, maybe put local uh, weeklies out of business, like the Herald that I had worked for, uh, the Transcript, right. and Freehold. You know, and all of those by starting a chain of weekly newspapers that would be given out free to people that used to be thrown in people's driveways or put in their mailbox. So they started Summerfield uh, News Corporation, which is a subsidiary of the Asbury Park Press. And the headquarters was in the old press building in Asbury Park. So when I was an editor, I worked sometimes out of there and sometimes in our a little office in Freehold. They started papers also in, in, uh, in Ocean County. Uh, in Ocean County, one in uh, Brick and one in Tom's River, although the headquarters for both was in Brick. And, and I don't know, the Advisor Journal might have been a paper in Middletown before Summerfield, and they might have bought it and put it in part of that chain. So that was the idea. What time frame? This is in, uh, I would say, uh, maybe 1986 to 89. And, that, and uh, by uh, uh, 1990, they were out of business. So, the advisor was active in the 70s, maybe it predated uh, that. It was just old that I don't know if any of the papers. Yeah, it was a very good paper. So I, I think I, I'm kind of correcting my assumption that that existed before Summerfield, which started in the 80s, and maybe Summerfield bought it and, and kept it for a while, and I don't know what happened to it. I don't know. If it's, I suspect it has not been collected, but it would uh, be nice to pull the history-related uh, articles from that and uh, collect them. Yeah, it would be. I have a few of them at home. Fortunately, you guys want them. <laughs> I have a couple of them uh, as well. Fortunately, we built down a paper with a longer bond in Korea that was being digitized. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, some papers that are modern, uh, are not that important, have not been collected anywhere, unfortunately. And they have a lot of local news that would be of interest to students. Now, the Esbury Park Press has no more local news than some of the weeklies on the shore. Yeah, that's right. Patch. Patch. Yeah. The Middletown Patch is worthless. Yeah, there's, there's just not the local news there used to be, uh, unless you're lucky to have some wealthy patron of a local newspaper that keeps it going at a loss. Yeah. But really, filling in newspapers for all these years is you pay daily, literally about advertising. And uh, I know I worked in retail for many years, just building up the ad, you bought a rent, and bourbon record, and 
And that's what kept these, these companies going. Very expensive to put the advertising in the ad rate like this. It doesn't have to be quite a bit of pay for it. But uh, once they have online stuff, it just disappears. Yeah, that was the end of it. And, you know, uh, fewer, fewer people, younger generations, they just don't read anything that's written on paper. I don't know if they're allergic to it or they couldn't do it. I have a little I work on the computer all day, and even when I was working on the newspapers, we work on the computer and stuff. But, uh, I still like to read actual books and actual newspapers and hold them in my hand. So I, I have a e newspaper of the other yeah, but I have a e newspaper of the New York Times. Too. Yeah. We were just discussing. I have another book on Monmouth County history called uh, "Not for Filthy Lucre's Sake" about the, uh, the 1600s in Monmouth County, which does pertain to Middletown. I mean, Middletown was the biggest town in New Jersey, bigger than North. Um, and uh, yeah, what a what cost! But I can't afford to buy them. You, know, <laughs> you buy them online, like 140 dollars or something. You know? Going back to the Middle Ages when people had to, you know, trade a house to buy a book or something. <laughs> it should be cheaper when you can do print on demand and all of that. So, yeah. I have a question about, I about Thomas Edison, and I read a book a bunch of years ago that kind of a novelized book. I can't think of it. There was a big rivalry between the West and the East, right? Yeah. Now, did that, was Westinghouse basically the third house? Westinghouse uh, is originally. Uh, his company is from Pittsburgh, and um, I think he was up. Uh, I don't know if he was originally from Pittsburgh or he was from Schenectady. He originally worked up in Schenectady, and he made his money by making uh, air brakes for uh, trains. So that's how uh, he made his uh, big fortune to start with. And then he decided that he could compete with Edison. Um, and use uh, alternating current, which really becomes the current that uh, is used throughout the world today. It's still current because you can move it over great distances uh, and use a smaller amount of copper wire to do it. So it's less expensive and uh, more efficient uh, in moving it around. This became really important uh, when uh, people in the 1880s, started thinking about using Niagara Falls to produce electricity with uh, water turbines and then moving that electricity to New York City. It would be impossible to do with uh, direct current. Because direct current, you can only move uh, you know, maybe less than a mile. Uh, and then you would need some kind of uh, station to, to move it on. Whereas you can have high tension wires through AC, hundreds of thousands of volts of AC. Across miles and miles. They felt that it was more dangerous than the open And Edison's, you know, <laughs> well, that's the main thing. You know, because I believe it's Edison consulted on the electric chair. And uh, <clears throat> that was uh, first used during the Battle of the Currents. And of course, uh, when the newspapers said to Edison, well, what kind of electricity do you think they should use? He said, I think they should use a Westinghouse AC generator, uh, in part uh, because it was good publicity for his, you know, his system, which was safer. It, uh, AC is seven times more lethal than DC. Yeah. And that was a legitimate concern. And uh, uh, Edison was concerned about the safety of the system. Uh, not that people weren't killed when they were putting in DC systems sometimes uh, or severely injured. Uh, so there was uh, some public relations aspect to it, but he was also concerned about the safety of uh, AC. This is why Edison buried his electric wires. So nobody would touch them and be electrocuted on the street as they were sometimes with. Um, AC wires that were used for um, arc lighting. Cities originally were used arc lights to light up the streets, you know, loud and way too bright <laughs> uh, to last very long once uh, other forms of lighting come in. 
Uh, electricity DC star was also safer than gas because of course the gas like blows out and um, gas is uh, toxic and will kill you. And that was happening from time to time in, in, in hotels and stuff. So Edison thought he had a cheaper, a more efficient and a safer system than gas. And Westinghouse was gonna uh, kind of challenge that. Uh, in terms of Topsy, Topsy wasn't electrocuted until I think uh, 1902. So that's after Edison was already out of the electric business and he didn't, um, he wasn't involved in the uh, Battle of the Currents was, you know, 15 years earlier than that. And uh, Westinghouse had won. So a lot of people, whenever I say, uh, I'm a jazz musician and my, my friend Anthony Ware is a great uh, alto sax player. I hear of him at some point. He said to me once, you know, people ask me, what do you do for a living? And I say, oh, I'm a jazz musician. And they say, I hate jazz. So who says that? <laughs> uh, but when you work for the Edison papers, if somebody finds out about that, uh, they, they say, oh, he stole everything from Tesla. That's the first thing they say to me. And uh, I usually just, don't bother getting into it with them because it's futile. But the fact is Westinghouse uh, hired Tesla as an engineer and the Westinghouse system using Tesla's motor that used three phase electricity, AC electricity, won the battle. And Edison went out of the electric industry uh, after that. So if Edison stole Tesla's ideas, you think he would have been victorious in the battle of the currents, but it was precisely the opposite. In fact, when Tesla was a young engineer for uh, Edison, Edison, uh, he knew he knew something about AC, so he did uh, give him the task of getting kinks out of a AC system that Edison had already designed. Um, Tesla left the Edison company and then he patented some of those ideas, maybe changing them a little bit. Um, what happened is he formed a company with two shysters from uh, Rawway right, who uh, said they would pay a big salary to Tesla if he turned the patents over to their company. And they stole the patents and basically fired Tesla and he ended up digging ditches the next year. So these businessmen, unscrupulous businessmen from, they did a dirty deed to Tesla and it was Westinghouse that kind of pulled him out of that poverty and trouble. Edison hated Westinghouse. He didn't hate Tesla. He hated Westinghouse. He called him a pirate. He wouldn't meet with him. Westinghouse kept saying, why don't we get together, Tom? You, know, you can come to my place in Pittsburgh. And Edison's like, no, I have nothing to do with you. So if there is a uh, animosity, it's between those two. And Edison had plenty of other fights with people, but not really with Tesla. So it's weird that he's known for this big battle with Tesla and now they hated each other and everything. Uh, when that's not true, but there are plenty of other hatreds that Edison had, including Westinghouse and uh, some of the other people who work with him at times. Okay, sorry. Thank you. He's got some books here.